Welcome to Super Agents Live. This is the one place where you can come and hear the most successful people in real estate. You'll hear how these super agents have built their businesses, how they stay productive, and how they stay motivated. Who am I? My name's Toby Salgado, and I made my first million in real estate. And I'm your host for the next 30 minutes while we talk to yet another amazing real estate entrepreneur. Stay tuned. Let's go. On the show today, we have Leo Pereja. Leo is the top performing agent for Keller Williams in the world and is billed as the most successful Latino in the real estate market today. In 2011, he was ranked number five in the nation by Wall Street Journal. And in that same year, he was named one of the 30 under 30. Last year, he had a whopping $83 million in sales volume. Hey, Leo, thanks for taking the time out today. Thanks for having me, Toby. So, Leo, I gave a brief overview of your background, but tell us a little bit about yourself and your business. Sure. Um, I do high volume. I've been doing it for many years now, and I think one of the keys to getting to a high volume business is taking a niche and becoming highly specialized at it. What did you do before you got into real estate? I was in high school. I uh, I've been doing real estate since I was 19 years old. I got licensed at 19 and started working for a realtor when I was 18 years old. Wow. I mean, so uh, th- that's early. Um, and it, it, it just resonated with you. What what drew you to real estate? So I went to high school and college during the tech bubble. And that was a very good lesson in how bubbles can be formed and pop. I was getting recruited out of high school to do graphic design and web design because I had won awards in high school for uh, graphic design by companies like AOL and such that are in my local market. And my freshman year of college, I, I part of the deal was I had to go get a college degree. And my freshman year of college, the tech bubble blew up, and $150,000 offers disappeared or turned to $40,000 positions. And it, um, I took a class in entrepreneurship and wrote a business plan on what it would cost to start a graphic design company. And after six months of calling and researching, it turned out I needed about $400,000 in two years to break even. And that's when I started looking around for other opportunities. Read Rich Dad, Poor Dad when I was 18, and it was the first time that someone explained, you know, cash flow, leverage, whether it's time, people, or money. And it kind of opened up my eyes to the opportunity. Yeah, you know, that's that's interesting. You know, I was was part of that tech bubble. Uh, uh, My first company that uh, was in 99, and we went out and raised $7 million to start that. And, th- and those are the days where you had to have a, a, a rack of servers in the back room. So for some people, if they hear four hundred grand to start a graphic design company, that sounds crazy. But in those days, it, it, it wasn't. You know, it's not like it is today at all. Um, so that was, that, that was a little bit lucky or for, for, fortunate for you that you went through that um, and that you found, this, uh, you found your passion, which is real estate, and you're killing it. Um, you know, through the years, you, I'm sure you've seen a lot of people have success and have failure. But overall, what do you think the single biggest hurdle is that real estate agents have to overcome? Well, first off, I think a real estate agent needs to understand that when you enter the real estate space, you, you're opening up a business. And I mean, that in a nutshell is, is all of it. Most folks don't understand that you have to have a business plan, a budget, sources of revenue. Um, and with a business come expenses, I, I don't think that you can even break through the first barrier and start performing without planning on investing, which is your marketing, whether you're using staff or virtual assistants, but there's just no way that you can do it all and even aim to hit a mediocre level, in my opinion. Yeah, you know what? Um, I agree with that, and I hear that often, that, you know, um, and, and, and it's funny, that question actually I have written as, uh, you know, what's the biggest hurdle that real estate entrepreneurs have to overcome? Because real estate agents are actually entrepreneurs. They're actually building a company. They have to go out, create that budget, hire a team, and replicate themselves. People who, who try to work in their business instead of on it typically don't, don't reach the level of success that you have. Uh, how did you... You know, you know, was it your background? You took that class in entrepreneurship. Is, is that what helped you realize that that selling real estate was actually a business? No, actually, um, I did not plan on being a realtor. I wanted to be a real estate investor. Mm. And I uh, ran into a gentleman who uh, my father met at a conference, not related to real estate. And my father said, my son's obsessed with real estate. He's reading every book he can. Uh, will you call talk to him? And I called the gentleman, and I, I offered to go work for him for free for the summer. 
and he said he was not interested in uh, babysitting Scott and his teenagers, what he told me. Oh, but if I was serious about real estate, I called this other gentleman out in Colorado, that he would teach me what I wanted to learn. So I called this gentleman out in Colorado, uh, who on the phone told me he could teach me everything I wanted to do, and uh, that would cost me $10,000. And at that point, that might as well have been $100,000 because I didn't have that kind of money. But I, I made a decision, and it's, it's a concept I've used many times throughout my life, which I call throwing your head over the fence, where you get so committed that, you know, you kind of burn the, the bridge and you're committed to the fight. So I sold my car that I had bought senior year of high school and paid off uh, through my freshman year of college, gave the strange man $10,000 and had about $7,000 left over. Bought a uh, old Accord for five thousand and had two thousand left, and signed a contract that I hadn't coached me for a year, which was an intense coaching program where we role played every day. Um, read a lot of what he told me to read, and part of the coaching he made me get a real estate license so I'd have a better understanding of comps and valuation and be able to earn a commission when I bought real estate or sold it. And I actually was resistant, but he said it was required, hmm. and that. Um, that year, about six months into the coaching, I got into an argument with my uh, landlord in college, and we had to find a new house because uh, it was a frat boy back then, and we had five guys making a bunch of noise. And I was advised uh, by a mentor that I should buy a house, and I thought that was impossible. But I spoke to a loan officer, and they said uh, I had excellent credit because I bought that car and paid it off. And I got approved for an FHA loan as a non-occupant co-borrower if I convinced my father to co-sign my loan. So I uh, went to go have dinner with my father that night. He said, if you lend me your signature and the down payment for 12 hours, uh, I would really appreciate it. And he asked me how that would work. And I borrowed 3% from my dad for the down payment, closed on the transaction since I was licensed. I got 3%, gave it back to him. Oh. Bought my first house for no money down, got the seller to pay all the closing costs, rented out three rooms out for 500 apiece and lived rent free and said, Oh my God, there is something to this. So that summer I went and uh, talked to all my fraternity brothers and said, let me talk to your mom and dad, wrote a little script and sold 11 houses in three months and made about $50,000. And at, uh, I just turned 20 at 20. That is big money. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that is a fascinating, inspiring story. So this is your first foray into into real estate investing, and, and it put you on the path to, to become a realtor. But, you know, talk to me about, you know, you're, you're a young guy. Um, you sold your car. Now, hold on a second. Were you in Colorado, or did you have to move to Colorado? No, 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 just over the phone conference call. I've always okay. been a D.C. Metro resident. Got you. Um, uh it's, I mean, that's a giant leap of faith because you could have you could have sold your car, gave this guy ten grand, and uh, and got nothing out of it. I mean, how did you how did you get to the point where you were able to to believe that this guy could could teach you to be successful? And I mean, how did you get to that level of faith? That's that's an incredible story to me. Um, I've always read a lot of personal growth and attended seminars. I, I you know, I've, I've been quoted in other publications that I've spent more on personal growth than I ever did on my college education. And, you know, it's, it's, it's that, it's that thirst for, for knowledge to find what the next best thing is, you know, and as a mentor, I interviewed him, read a bunch of reviews, called some folks who'd been mentored by him and everyone said great things. And it, it's, it's, Going back to what I said, it's investing in your business, which when you get started, you are the business. You are the, the stuff that goes on between your two ears is so important. I had an agent with Kel Williams call me yesterday from North Carolina, and uh, his question was, you know, as, as a 24-year-old, what's, you know, how do I handle objection about my agent? I said, there's no objection. It's, it's all in between your two ears. You have to make the decision that you're good enough that you can handle the business, and and, you know, at any point in your career, you have a value proposition. When I was 19, I literally would tell sellers, be like, you're my only client. I have no wife and kids. I will be here every day if I have to. I'll show it myself. I'll hold it open every day. You know, now that I have a large team, I said, you know, for the same price that you're hiring a new agent, you'll have a staff and a system and everything else. But no matter what stage in your career you're in, you have a value proposition as long as you understand and you believe that you have value to deliver to a client. Right. No, that is good. So, so you, you got this coach. Um, he, he did a lot for you. Uh, 
and I would imagine, I'm going to ask it. So do you think that you would, you would be achieving the same level of su- success that you are today if you did not have that coach or mentor? So I've always had a coach in my entire career. Since wow. the first six months, I've always paid someone to coach me. Wow. So the answer is yes. I know I would have succeeded, but it's how, how, how long and how difficult. You know, the greatest athletes in the world, the greatest performers in the world, have coaches and most of the time they have multiple coaches like you know basketball player will have a throwing coach an endurance coach because they're experts at one thing and, 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 and you know, if I, my opening statement is become highly specialized yeah. so i i seek out people who can show me how to become highly specialized and to me if i can pay someone to shorten my learning curve and bang my head against the wall i'm going to pay all day long absolutely that is great so uh, you know I think I, I would agree with you that having a mentor, having a coach is extremely helpful. You obviously believe that because even, you know, even at, you know, you're a super agent and you still have a coach. Um, m- most new agents uh, or most aspiring agents do not have a coach. They do not have a mentor. Um, and maybe it's because they don't they, they don't have that 10 grand or they're not willing to s- sell their car. Um, h- how do you go out and find a mentor if you, if you, you know, let's say for a new agent, they, they, they can't afford one. They can't afford that 10 grand. So, uh, you know, I, I get asked all the time, if you could start over, what would you do? I said, I'd go find the biggest agent in my market that I want to become and go work for him or her. You know, I, I think that's the shortest path to success. You know, not all people get along. So find the one you mesh with, the one you want to aspire to be and absorb as much as possible. You could, you know, and, and when you know, I meet a new agent, I also say it's important which office you go to because if you're surrounded by folks that all do 20 transactions, the world looks one way. Yeah. I, I probably had five, six years where I could never break over 50 transactions. And when someone did three to four or 500 transactions, it was, it wasn't in the realm of my possibility. The first year I broke through that, I went to 192, then 400 and 600. And I now know all the top agents in the country. Most of them that you interviewed when you emailed me, I'm personal friends with. And, the people you surround yourself with starts changing completely in the reality. And when somebody says, you know, do this, it's, it's completely normal, accessible. And I have access to people to ask these questions. So you just start operating at a different level. Right. You know, that goes back to Jim, Jim Rohn says that you're the average of the five people that you spend the most time with, you know, and if you are, you know, if you are an agent out there and you hang around with four broke people, uh, chances are you're going to be the fifth. Um, you know, one of the things you said early on, so you go out and find, you know, find somebody that you admire, um, uh, go out and work for them. You're willing to work for uh, the first guy. You said, hey, I'll, I'll work for you for free for a year. Um, is, is that something you, you know, how, how does somebody do that? And so if I'm a new agent, I find somebody. I found you, Leo. I'm like, hey, Leo, you're killing it. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you two examples. I have one, one guy who works with me who um, found me about four years ago, called me up said, I want to talk to you. I want to meet you. He drove down from two states away and said, I've read about you. I want to be like you. I want to come learn from you. I will do anything that you tell me to. Um, I'll start at whatever place you want me to. He just passed his license. Um, He then got a license in my state. He asked me to invest $2,000 for his move because he didn't even have that. But he promised to pay it back, and it just felt like a genuine uh, statement. He moved, he started making $10 an hour for me. And last year I paid him 192,000 in his commission splits because he just absorbed everything. And, you know, I had clients who call me and say, it's funny to be with him because he sounds like me. He acts like me. He talks like me. (laughs) But it's, it's, it's just the willingness to absorb as much as possible. And, and being, and having a level of humility to do that. You know, for you, I mean, so you've had this meteoric rise. I mean, you are a sponge. You, you want to learn as much as you can from as many people as you can, or at least successful people. You know, I'll interrupt you because I always laugh when I hear meteoric rise. I, I said, yeah, it was, a over, it was a 12-year overnight success. Right, right. Yeah. Um, you know, for you, you know, was there ever a time where you felt like it was just too hard and you wanted to quit? And, and how did you push through that roadblock and find success? I mean, I, 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 I told my mother when I was younger and now my wife, I, I say 28 days out of the year, I feel like Superman and two days out of the month, I just don't want to get out of bed because as an entrepreneur, which I've been my entire adult life since I could sign my own name, you always have those thoughts. Am I going to do it again next month? 
what happens when the, when the market changes? Right. Can I survive this? We, you know, we, we live fraud. in D.C. So, yeah, well, we're in D.C., so we, we get a lot more government chatter of, you know, sequestration for government shutting down. I'm like, what if my entire business model disappears? Yeah. And I don't think you'll ever quiet those those sounds. So, you know, to me, success is completely the journey. I mean, it's the process. You know, you're constantly correcting and overcorrecting and testing and refining. And, you know, I, I, I have a, a saying where you, you, you have to embrace failure. And I'm talking about utter ridiculous failure. You know, I can't tell you how many times I spent 10, 20, 30 thousand dollars on a idea that didn't work out. But part of it is you have to see it through. Yeah. To see if it even worked. I recently heard a guy talk about talk about failure. He said, "Hey, he's talking about you know a failure." And he said, hey, uh, "Lessons cost a lot." No, I'm sorry. Lessons cost money, and good ones cost a lot. So uh, you know, there's always something to learn from from wherever you failed. Um, what do you think the single biggest thing is that most realtors get wrong? Oh, I think the hardest part is I, a lot of people get into the business because they get seduced by the idea of flexibility and high income. And the funny thing is the highest performing realtors I've met, you know, work 10, 12 hours a day and aren't flexible at all. So it, it, it's, it's sticking to the routine and treating it like a business, behaving like you're at a job and doing your sales calls and time blocking and doing stuff that by definition would attract folks to the industry it's the quite opposite that gets you there. So um, I, I really just understanding that this is not part-time, that this is not something you can do on your own time because no one cares if you fail. That's the biggest thing. When you have a job, you have someone to hold you accountable, i.e. the person paying you uh, your paycheck. But here it's just you. So if you feel like sleeping in on a Tuesday, you can sleep in on a Tuesday and you can do it on a Wednesday and a Thursday as well. So, yeah. You know, I get up at six in the morning every single day. I work out for an hour. I'm at the office before eight. I have, you know, clean breakfast. I eat four or five times a day, small, clean meals, because I need that much energy and fuel to run at the pace I run. I, I tell folks I live in dog years because I do more in a week than most people do in a year. Wow. Um, you know, for you, so, so you know, here's my question, and I, and I want to uh, – I'm going to uh, – uh, Ask it a different way, but so normally I ask you what your aha moment is, um, and I I think it's gonna it's gonna be go out and find a niche. Uh, it, it, am I correct on that? In, in what sense the aha moment in my career or in well yeah in your career? Well, let me just ask. So yeah, tell us about your that first aha moment that that helped you so, that, that realize that you I were on I the right path. Big one. Okay. The first one is realizing that you can do it, and what you can do is is up to you to decide. For me, it was deciding I could go from 50 to pick a number, you know, two, three, four, five, six hundred transactions. Because nothing, I didn't change. I, I don't. I'm not a different human being. I probably more systematic, but it, it was just making the decision that that's what I wanted to do. Identifying that that's what I wanted to do, finding people who've done it and learn from them. That was a huge aha. And then the second one is uh, really realizing that just because you're in real estate, you don't have to do what everybody else does. Mm. So I, I, I say this quite a bit. I think our industry is one of the most incredible industries that I know of because I haven't seen another industry where you can truly, if, if you're honest with yourself and figure out what your God-given gifts are, what you're naturally wired to do, what you love to do, and find a niche around that, you can be wildly successful. So for example, I like numbers. I like investing. I've been investing my entire career. I own lots of rentals. I flip property. I lend hard money. I speak that language. So for me, hanging out with a bunch of investor folks who are going to talk about ROI and loss severity and IRR and all kinds of stuff that most people don't like to talk about, I thrive on and enjoy it. I can produce value. I can show a unique selling proposition, and I love it. And then there's other folks who build a fantastic geographical business because they know the area, they're involved in the PTA, they're, they're, they're involved in their passions. And as, as long as you can identify that and get really good at it, that's, I think that's the key of the business. I, I think we're in an era where, you know, it's, it's been an interesting, since I got into real estate in 2002, I've been hearing that real, real tours are going to become obsolete because of technology. And 
months, about a month ago, I saw the CEO of Zillow speak, and, you know, as an industry, a technology industry in real estate, they've all come to a consensus. Realtors aren't going away. Right. Now, the ones that will survive are the ones who can deliver value above and beyond. Here are some MLS listings and I can unlock the door because anybody can get that information now. So where you become a value is when you can show them stuff and explain stuff that they don't have access to. You know, real estate is infrequent, highly complex, highly emotional transaction. It is on average done six or seven times in an entire American family's life. Every time it changes, the markets change, the technologies change, the processes change. So there's a ton of value that can be delivered if you understand what value you're delivering to your clients. So, you know, uh, yeah, that's an unbelievable statement that you just said, or that whole answer. Um, uh, you know, travel agents became obsolete because of, or for the most part became obsolete because of technology. When it comes to realtors, you know, a realtor that knows the inventory out there, that you know, he shows a house, says, "Hey, let's let's uh, I'm going to show you this four bedroom, three bath house." Your client doesn't like it, and he goes, "Hold on a second, the next street over, there's another four bedroom, it's and it's on the market for six hundred or whatever." Um, you know, how important in terms of delivering value is 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 things like knowing your inventory intimately well? I think it's everything. I mean, that that's you know, I. I have a current client right now who's buying a $2 million home and he owns a commercial investment REIT. You know, they, they have global holdings all over the uh, all over the world where they're doing hundred and $200 million transactions. And he goes, I, I have access to, you know, Trillion, Zillow. I can call the realtor and let him in. The reason you're representing me is because I want your opinion. I want your opinion of the neighborhood. I want your opinion of the construction. I want your opinion and the resale ability, who, who, who will buy this house for me in three to five years if I do these things to it? So I think there's always value. If, again, you really need to have that conversation with yourself and be willing to invest and learn enough to be able to deliver the value. Right. So, you know, you are, um, uh, you sell houses. You're doing phenomenally well. You are a hard money lender, which is... A, Awesome. I mean, I would I'd like to talk to you a little bit about that, as well as you have horizontal income from a bunch of rental houses. Um, how do you, with all that stuff, Leo, how do you stay productive and focused on a day to day basis? So I always say one of the hardest things I have to focus on is saying no. I have all okay. kinds of interesting opportunities that come up, and, and, you know, my new favorite word is what is noise? Yep. And, you know, it's Pareto's law. How much time am I spending? I just, uh, read Gary's book, uh, The One Thing. Mm -hmm. And I started reading about six months ago and got a little sad because I, I realized how distracted I was and put it down and didn't want to read it again. <laughs> but then I finally picked it up. And it's, it's really drilling down to, okay, I have X amount of hours I work a week. What, where are those hours being spent? And then if I break it down into silos, how much money is that making me? Because right. it always comes down to what am I making per hour? I, I, you know, when I, when I speak to large groups and people say, who's your first hire? I always say it's who, whom you don't expect. Your first, my first hire in real estate at 19 was a maid to come clean my apartment on Saturdays for $60 because what I would take on a Saturday or Sunday to do my laundry, clean the dishes, and, you know, get ready for the week. If I paid someone $60, I could do two showings and potentially make five, ten thousand dollars $10,000. So, you really need to understand what your time is worth. You know, I, I always encourage folks who, who are starting to become disciplined, keep a notepad and write down what you do. If you look at that notepad and you're doing eight, nine, ten dollar an hour work, stop it. That's your first thing you let go. Right. The, the, the ROI on cleaning your house is ridiculously low <laughs> compared, to, compared to selling a house. You know, but what about for those, for those people who, you know, they're starting out and, um, you know, dollars are tight, right? I mean, how do you... Um, and, and they're like, wow, geez, 60 bucks, that's a full tank of gas that uh, tomorrow I can show houses. Um, uh, how, how does somebody get there, Leo? I mean, that, I, I love that idea, but I, you know, I think that's tough for a lot of people to implement. So uh, one of the, 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 the folks I love listening to, whether it's speaking in public or reading his books, is Gary Vaynerchuk. I'm not sure you're familiar yeah. with him. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I actually just agreed to speak at a conference this summer because he was the keynote speaker, and I just wanted to meet him in person, got to hang out for a little bit. But cool. he, I love his stuff because it's so rich. He just work hard. 
you know, have a second job, wait tables at night, do whatever. If you want this bad enough, figure it out. You know, the average American watches 4.7 hours of television per day. That's up from 4.5 last year because of TiVo and Hulu and Netflix, because now we can watch whatever we want. And that's seven days a week. That's 30 hours a week. It's a work so week. wake up earlier. Yeah. Work up, wake up earlier, go to bed later, figure it out. And if you can't, this business is not for you. Yeah, you know, uh, and, and, and Vaynerchuk's book, Crush It, is an awesome book. Um, you know, what do you know now, Leo, that you wish you would have known when you started? If anything. You had pretty good training. I mean, that, you know, that, that's the golden rule. There's a ton of stuff I wish I knew now than what I know now. But it, it it's really willing to invest in yourself and just not being afraid to invest money and time and just do the work to do the repetition. And what did they say that Tiger Woods uh, hits 3000 balls a day? How long has he been on top of the world? I mean, you, you have to be willing to do the work and go out and seek out knowledge. Yeah. You know, and I've heard a good rule of thumb in terms of, in terms of investing in yourself is, you know, invest uh, a lot of successful people I talk to, they, they tend to invest about 10% of, of what they make back into themselves. Yeah, that's, a, that's, that's a good rule of thumb. And I would say, you know, when I was specializing in learning stuff, I spent more than that. But, you know, if I, so, you know, I, I wanted to go after probate. I found a guy in Southern California that does 150 probate deals a year. I called him. I said, will you teach me what you do? He said, write me a check for $2,500. Sent him a check, got on a plane, spent a day with him, got his scripts and figured out how he did it. I haven't even implemented it yet, but before I went down that road and tried, I went and learned how somebody who does it very well does. I can't tell you how many times I hear realtors say, well, I'm trying this, I'm trying that. I'm like, well, so that's a good idea. What, what method are you going to use to track it? Right. When do you know that you spent enough money or enough time trying it to see if it was worth the ROI? Yeah. Man, why don't people do that more often? I mean, that, I mean, I, again, I, I find that fascinating that that a super successful guy like you, um, uh, you you're still looking for other opportunities to, uh, you know, I'll say, exploit for the lack of a better word. But uh, um, I'm, I'm I'll, I'll use a different word. I'll call it shift market there you shift. Go. Okay. And worked six months ago, twelve months ago, will not work. The only thing I'm a hundred percent sure of is the market will change, and I'm going to have to shift. Right. And that's actually my value proposition for my clients. I can tell them, you know. I can show you 10 years that I've evolved, and this is what's happening right now. Um, this is what you need to do if you want to be a buyer seller in this market. Um, you know, uh, you, you talked about Gary Keller's book, The One Thing. You know, we, we've had uh, Dave Jenks on the show, and, uh, and all through Dave's interview, he, 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 when talking about how to be successful, he really h- kept saying, you know, if you want to be successful, you have to be continually learning. You have to be learning-based in everything you do. And uh, I'm, I'm hearing that. I mean, that is an absolute theme with, with, uh, with your story. Uh, you know, tell us one thing, Leo, right now that's working for you in your business right now. One thing? Yeah, one thing. Again, so I, I've developed a very specialized skill set. So, um, you know, I'll tell you a couple things we're doing. We're working with infill builders who were, you know, I live in the D.C. metro area, so um, space is rare. So we're finding older homes that are physically obsolete for the area that have a good size lot. My clients buy them between four and 600,000, tear it down, build a four to 5,000 square foot home, and then I list them from 1.2 to 1.3. So, again, you know, these people have access to the MLS. They can find deals. But where I produce value is by finding opportunity that wasn't there for me. Right. You know how we do that? We go door knock. We find specific areas where that, you know, we our, our ideal candidate, the property is. And we go knock on their door. Um, I had an appointment today with an investment group that sells 100 homes a year, and I had to get them a proposal. But... They said, you know, we have an agent on staff. We can do it ourselves. But what we want is an additional person who understands what we do to give a second opinion. I mean, even if it costs us a little bit more, we'll outsource it if we get that value. I mean, I I think the biggest thing realtors don't understand, and one of the things, you know, people talk about is commission compression. And and I, I think it all comes back to value. If you're not delivering value, why should you get paid that much? Right. And as you as you said before, there's lots of different ways that you can deliver value. 
Um, you know, let's talk about social media a little bit because that's, you know, uh, small businesses are moving towards that. Nobody has really cracked the code uh, with Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever. You know, how, do you use social media and how, did, how, how do you use it? So I think I was the last person to ever get Facebook. I still don't have a personal account. I just have a fan page. Um, but, you know, again, finding out how you're wired, I think that's the most important part. I don't like it. I'm not, you know, I personally say I don't have time for it. So I do business in a very, uh, sometimes I describe it as an old school way. I have probably 10 clients that give me 500 deals a year and because the skill sets and the relationships I've developed, I can do that kind of business. But if you're naturally inclined and you like it, there's, you know, I'd go learn from Gary V to see how you leverage that. But that's not something I want to go after. To me, it's that would go in the noise category for me. I'm not saying that social media isn't fantastic because I know folks that do big business with it. But it, I think whenever you're, someone's listening to calls like this, it's, it's really listening to what resonates with whom you are, because if you're doing something that you don't like, you're not going to do it very long. Yeah. You know, it's funny that you're talking about Gary Vaynerchuk. If, if, if somebody out there in the audience searches, uh, um, best tweets for real estate agents, Gary Vaynerchuk, he wrote a blog post and I actually reposted it and it was 13 tweets. A realtor should have answered instead of me. And basically he just, he did uh, you can do a Twitter search, twitter.com slash, uh, slash search and he searched real estate and he found all these people that were talking about about real estate hey i need to find a new house or i'm moving and gary uh and he's super successful guy answered those tweets and and not one realtor did so um that's interesting you know what about zillow and trulia do you do you do any marketing on those sites and and how's that i'm working? sorry say that again um sites like uh you know Z zillow and trulia are also social media in in a specialized kind of way um, do you do any marketing yeah, on those sites? That, that's a great question. I, I think part of the the answer to it is you need to stay open. So once upon a time, there was house values and home gain and all that stuff 10 years ago. And I signed up for all of them and wasted money and nothing came of it. And I kind of just said, it doesn't work. Um, I was at a Boomtown Unite uh, event about a month ago for all the other brokers that have a Boomtown account. And I heard some fantastic success stories with both. So I'm, I'm looking into it to see if, you know, how much money to spend per month and then decide how many months I'm going to try it. And, and, and again, this is how I would make a decision. If I'm going to spend money on uh, a software or something like that, I would seek out who are the most five successful people using the platform, find out exactly how they're using it, how they're leveraging it, how they're converting it, yep. how much they're spending and how long it took to get there. Because what happens is you hear, oh, I closed you know, 86 transactions with Zillow last year. Well, how long did you spend money before you actually converted one? What drip follow-up system? Is that a six-month incubation period? Is that a 12-month incubation period? Do you have the people or the stamina to do it yourself? Yep. Are you that good on email? Do you have a, a BlackBerry or an iPhone or an email-capable phone that you can respond immediately? Because if you don't respond to internet leads within the first five minutes, they're worthless. So – be willing to do all that before spending a dollar. Because so many people say, well, do you think that's a good idea? And if I sit on this call, yeah, it's a great idea. I do it. People might go get an account, but forgot to ask 10 other questions yeah. before making that informed decision. And I'll tell you, for, for you personally, as well as people in the audience, if you listen to, there's a question I ask all the time, and um, uh, you could probably figure out all that stuff from listening to some of my interviews. And, and I will tell you, high level for some people, uh, some people have described it as, you know, they were drinking out of a water hose and then it, they started drinking out of a fire hose. And other people go, Ugh, I get nothing out of it. Um, you know, y y have you considered writing a book, Leo? I mean, I'm way off topic here, but but uh, I mean, you, there's so much in this. It, we spent 28 minutes together and there's so much good stuff. Um, I think you could write a book. Have you thought about that? I do, but it goes back to what we talked about at the beginning. ROI. What's, what's, what, what's my priority? And right. as you know, I I always uh, my my buddy and I always say I don't I have mentors that are in their fifties and sixties, and I'm talking about fifty hundred million uh, net worth. I say to them, "You're a made man. I'm, I'm I'm still a man in the making." So to me, it's all about what I'm building, how I'm being smart about it, how I'm. Re removing leverage so I have assets that you know can take care of me and I don't have to work this hard for the rest of my life. 
Okay, that's a good answer. Um, again, because you're a wealth of knowledge, I'm going to ask you kind of a kooky question. Um, you know, what is something I didn't ask you, but I should have asked you? That's a good question. Uh, we, we covered quite a bit in 30 minutes. Okay. Um, I, I, I would kind of just reiterate everything we talked about. It. You know, I, I think before folks get into this industry is really sit down and decide if you want to do what it takes. I mean, uh, real estate is not a job. It's a lifestyle. Are you prepared to talk about it with all your friends? You know, are you prepared to approach everyone you know and ask for business? Um, and if, if, if the answer is no, ask yourself why. And, you know, and, and figure out what you would need to get comfortable in order to, for that to be a yes. And that normally goes back to are you willing to do the work to learn everything you need to do and be able to deliver that level of value? Good answer. Well, well, we're at the wrapping up here. We're at the ask the agent round, and this is where I fire off questions, and you come back at us with answers that hopefully will help each of our audience members move the needle in their own businesses. If you could recommend only one book, what would it be? I mean, I can't answer that. I'd, I'd give you authors. I like <laughs> so you know. This, Especially getting started, I would read a bunch of Dave Ramsey books. I mean, I, I think the biggest hurdle folks had in getting into this business is cash flow. Yeah. And I think, you know, again, without getting completely sidetracked, it comes back to how we live as a country. Um, you know, you have to be willing to live like nobody else so you can live like nobody else, which is a Dave Ramsey quote. You know, are you willing to get rid of the big house or the big car or the payments and live much smaller in order to be able to grow as, as you're growing a small nut every month is the fastest way to grow faster. So, you know, how can you reduce your expenses by a third? So you don't need six months in the bank at the same number when you were considering getting into real estate and, and, and be willing to make those sacrifices. Uh, and then just, I mean, uh, outside of being a Keller agent, I think Gary's books are fantastic, whether it's you know, you're a real estate agent, the one thing shift, just really understand your craft. I mean, I can't tell you how many agents I always give the example that, you know, at, on the appointment is when they practice. Yeah. Become masterful of your scripts. You know, you're a professional athlete doesn't practice at the game. They practice all week, six hours a day. So the game is easy. You know, there, there's not a objection I haven't heard or haven't role played thousands of times when I'm at an appointment. And I always sound like I have the answer. It's not because I'm smarter than anybody else. It's because I've studied my craft and gotten really good at answering questions. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you started that off with uh, basically you answered that, uh, you know, you, you should, with that Dave Ramsey quote, it was about having a budget, you know, and watching your cash flow. And, and that's important because just like uh, internet companies, they go out and raise venture capital and uh, they want to raise as much as they can because they, they want to extend that runway. You know, the, the, the longer runway you have, the more likely you're going to achieve success. So I, I love that answer. Um, do you have an internet tool like an Evernote that you're in love with uh, that you can share with our audience? Mm, no. Yeah. <laughs> I have a little notepad that sits on my desk. I mean, it, again, I, I, when it comes to technology and systems, I always tell people, find one that you will use because there's all kinds of incredible software and CRM out there. But if it's too complicated yeah. or it doesn't have the, the features or compatibility to your other software, you know, just like simple to do's. I mean, a book that kind of changed my, my way of organizing and planning was uh, Getting Things Done by David Allen, GTD. And he's got a whole methodology that plugs into your outlook and everything else. But again, so I have a, an issue like that. I research it, find out who's pretty well known for it. I actually spent $900 and took his one-day class because the book was really boring and I, I learned audibly. So I went and took the one-day seminar and that changed the way I organized. Wow. Well, you know, I want to talk about some of your personal habits that have contributed to success. And before you answer that, well, here's a question. Do you have any personal habits that have contributed to, to your success? And, and what you said earlier, um, you know, you wake up at 6 a.m., you work out, you know, you take care of your body, you, you eat clean meals. Um, you know, what are some of the other personal habits that have contributed to your success? It's just, it's just really about your mind, your state of mind and who you surround yourself with and what comes in. I mean, I, you know, like you said, you know, the four people that you're closest to is who you are. And that is so true. You know, my 
my peer group, my friends think at a high level do incredible things. And like I mentioned, I, I have a, a group of gentlemen I call my uncles that have, you know, done very incredible things and just hearing their stories make what I do feel small and make me think I'm not thinking big enough. I'm not pushing myself hard enough. Wow. And I literally, I constantly think, am I, am I wasting my time doing this thing if, if it's not going to get me to the next level? So, you know, I think one of the things I'm very conscious about, if I, if I were constantly around everybody else and I was the biggest fish in the room, I'm obviously in the wrong, fit or the wrong room. I, I want to be around people who are going to show me, guide me, teach me, because if I'm the only one in the room with anything to teach, I, you know, it might feel good for your ego, but that's not going to help you grow at all. Yeah. Wow. Well, you know, what are the first three steps a new agent should do to begin building his business in the next 10 days? Um, have a database. Put all your, every person you know, qualify them if you were to be the realtor of choice. And then ask them if you can stay in touch with them. I, I think the you know the basic concept of a sphere of influence is the most powerful thing. Is the cheapest thing to do. And if you don't know anybody, go build one. Go knock on doors. Go meet people. Go get in front of centers of influence. That's you know the definition of SFI and start building that. I, I, it's the cheapest, fastest way to build a business. Yeah, I, I love that. So you know, database uh, and stay in touch with them. How do you do that? Do, do uh, you earlier? I mean, you're you're. You know uh, technology enough that you were talking about drip campaigns, but how do you, you know, once I have that database with names in it, um, how do I continue to, to, to ping them as I go along? Uh, and that's kind of the easy part in this world of technology. And you can just buy off the shelf stuff, whether it's Cat Williams, 33 Touch, or any of the other multiple touch points, but just figure out a way. And, and you know, I, I live in the city with the worst traffic in the United States. We're now officially worse than LA. Hmm. And half the time is while I'm sitting in traffic, I literally scroll through my phone, find a name I haven't called in a while and call them. You would be blown away. Perfect example. I went to happy hour with my team yesterday, a contractor. We sent a lot of business to invite us out. It's very nice. A gentleman comes over from across the room, said, Hey, Lee, I haven't seen you in three or four years. This single person has bought probably 15 homes for me and I haven't called him in two years. Oh. <laughs> he, I asked him, you know, cause the markets really come back and he really bought well and sold. And that's why we did so many transactions for him. So he's sitting on $2 million and then we need to grab lunch. He needs to figure out where to put it. Yeah. You know, and, and, and you know what that ties into Leo that, that I think a lot of realtors don't think about and, but internet people do is uh, it's, it's called lifetime value. And that is, you know, you, you have a client, you sell them a piece of property, but over the course of that, the lifetime of, of your relationship, I mean, they, they, he might be like that guy, buy 15 houses. So, uh, you know, I think keeping it, you know, that's why you want to keep in touch with them. But hey, Leo, give us one piece of parting guidance and let us know where we can find you and we'll sign off. <laughs> again, I, I think I've said it over and over again, you know, really sit down and figure out if this is what you want to do. And the way to answer that is find someone whose business you'd like to uh, achieve or emulate, go figure out what it is it takes to do that and, and make that decision. Cause I, I as an industry, I, I get upset because I think it's, it's told it to be much easier than it really is. And if folks knew what it would take, they may have made a different decision, but I, I still think it is the most fantastic opportunity uh, available to folks without huge, you know, barriers of entry, like a lot of other industries, you don't need a couple hundred thousand dollars to get into real estate like you do to, you know, buy a franchise for a subway or something like that. So, I mean, the money that can be made in this industry for the required, you know, investment is unparalleled. I, I agree. Unparalleled. Well, Leo, hey, thanks so much for coming on the show. I mean, this this whole time, I mean, you, you were just, I mean, there's tons of actual, you know, advice just oozing out of you. So, I, I can't thank you enough, and uh, uh, we'll see you around. And and hopefully, maybe you know, I'd love to have you on the show again, and maybe dig into to uh, something like building a niche for yourself or something. Sounds great, Charlie. Thank you for having me. All right, see you, Leo. Okay, you heard it, folks. That was Leo Pereja. What a fantastic interview! I was pumped up do, doing doing that one the whole time. In this episode, Leo urged all of us to get a mentor or get a coach. And for him, that was a key to his early success. And even now, after being super successful, he still has a coach and he still reaches out. And he tries to find those rooms where he's not the smartest guy in the room, 
where he might be the dumbest guy in the room. That is the area or place where he finds personal growth. Leo is also a big proponent of investing in yourself. He said it over and over again, invest your money, invest your time. If you have to scale back your current lifestyle to give yourself a bigger runway to find success in your niche, you know, and, and Leo said that more than a few times, go out and find a specialty, whether that's a specialty in terms of a product or a specialty in a current market area. I hope, I really hope that you enjoyed this interview as much as I have. If you have enjoyed it and you want to continue getting these free coaching sessions, please, <laughs> it will help me a lot. Go to iTunes and leave a rating and review. And if you really want to help, send me an email. Send my personal email, toby at superagentslive.com. You know, sometimes I've, I've been doing this now for three months, and uh, sometimes I'm not sure if, if what I'm doing here is helping people. So let me know. And if you think this is helpful to you, I would love it if you shared it with your friends. If you could help us grow our audience, I would be forever in your debt. So until next time, I'm Toby Salgado, and I personally thank you for listening to Super Agents Live. Let's go. Concentrated.